Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Peters. I'm the project officer for the Mar STA, and it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend, Dr. Michael Obundo. Uh, Mike is the CEO of um, Managing Director, I should say, of Oxygen Pixel in Singapore, and I've known Mike for over 10 years and uh, always been very impressed by his skill set. Uh, he's going to talk about harnessing mar marine renewable energy, and he's going to give us an overview of what's actually happening in the industry, what the costs are, what the status of technologies are, and where the likely low-hanging fruit to exploit to capture some of the enormous amount of energy that lives in our oceans. So on that note, I will hand over to Mike. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Steve. Well, good afternoon, everyone. You can call me Mike. Um, so let kick, let's uh, look at harnessing marine renewable energy. Uh, and this is part of the Mars webinar series. So Ocean Pixel, as a brief background, uh, was a spin-off of the Energy Research Institute at Nanyang Technological University in 2014. We have catered mostly to support with data intelligence, um, a lot of sustainability projects around the marine uh, area um, and building uh, uh, what we can contribute towards the blue economy. So one of the main confusions that people have uh, about marine renewable energy is uh, sometimes they equate it to ocean renewable energy and even sometimes to offshore renewable energy. So let's uh, get that squared away. Uh, marine renewable energy is defined by the European Science Foundation as renewable energy production, which makes use of marine resources or marine space. Here are examples uh, of marine resources, offshore wind, you know, um, solar irradiance, obviously, using floating solar, you can harness um, solar uh, energy, uh, marine biomass, and uh, ocean renewable energy resources, such as those from currents, those from tide, tide heights, uh, those from waves, and those from uh, gradients, uh, the saltiness of the water, um, salinity gradients, and also the temperature gradients, um, ther uh, thermal gradients. So, Marine renewable energy is not exactly the same as ocean renewable energy, but uh, ocean renewable energy is a subset within marine renewables. So ocean renewable energy has these five different resources whose principle is primarily those that are ocean driven. So I will go through them and explain each one in a little bit. Um, currents, which is the flow of water, um, very basically. Um, tides, you have high tides and low tides, and you can harness the difference in those tide heights using technologies like tidal barrages. Wave energy um, is produced from the surface motion, um, some disturbance, whether it's from wind or some uh, internal um, ocean waves as well. Um, and you have uh, the temperature difference, which is harnessed by a technology called Ocean Thermal Energy Converters, so, or OTEC for short. So the hot water on the surface and the cold water, um, maybe 800 meters or one kilometer below the surface um, is something you can uh, uh, use to quote unquote boil um, uh, uh, fluids like ammonia, which has very low um, uh, a boiling point. And this can be used to run turbines and therefore generate electricity. So salinity gradient um, is power available from uh, the differences in concentration of salt. So where you have bay areas where uh, you have salt, salty water and also rivers that feed into that area which are not salty. Uh, you can use uh, uh, membranes, uh, membrane technology to harness uh, electricity uh, from the difference in their um, salinity concentration. So these five different uh, ocean-driven renewable energy resources uh, are the five main um, uh, uh, ORE um, that, that are, are referred to uh, when we talk about ocean renewable energy. Then again, they are a subset of marine renewables. So you don't see offshore wind here. Why? Because they are not primarily ocean driven, but wind, uh, wind driven. And solar is not obviously ocean driven, but uh, is sun driven. So, but they are still called marine renewable energy. So for ocean renewable energy, the principles of these resources like tides, for instance, 
are astronomical in nature. So the gravity uh, from the Earth, Sun, and Moon causes the tides, some of uh, which um, causes currents called tidal currents. Ocean currents are different from tidal currents, but ocean current is because of the hot and cold in the water. And so you have flow that's circulating as well. So if we look at uh, marine renewable energy to include ocean renewables as well as those that are um, not ocean renewables called offshore wind and marine floating solar, we can see that the technology spectrum ranges from um, very early stage to let's say commercial stage. A technology readiness level scale is used um, in the industry, uh, primarily started by the NASA folks uh, to look at their space program. And this has been adopted by the marine renewable energy and offshore renewable energy uh, industry. Um, so where TRL level one is where you have um, basic principles observed and reported or where you have theories, um, you know, uh, indication um, of uh, potential uh, technology to be developed and uh, technology readiness level nine is when you have um, a fully operational technology that's already commercially viable or already deployed. So the spectrum in between two to eight um, uh, ranges from concept to lab testing, field testing, pilot demonstrations, etc. So you actually have uh, ocean renewable energy systems and uh, other marine renewable energy systems um, laid out in this slide. So whereas offshore wind is already commercially viable, um, same as uh, marine floating solar in the pre-commercial stage, um, already moving into the commercial stage, um, are, uh, can be investable um, depending on the project, of course. Uh, tidal range, uh, although it is mature um, because it uh, has similar principles to hydro, um, hydroelectric uh, power plants uh, where you trap water and release water, um, but this time using uh, tides as the principle of bringing the water in and you wait for low tide to release water out. Um, this has been there since the 70s and, and uh, we have large scale power plants um, around the world, um, uh, France, uh, UK, Canada, and, uh, and also in Korea. Uh, but tidal range, harnessing tidal range is uh, tricky because uh, they have seen huge environmental impact uh, when you trap water and build huge infrastructure in the Bay Area where you're supposed to trap um, large uh, amount of, um, of, uh, of seawater. So uh, people have been moving away from tidal range technology and looking at maybe uh, just smaller, smaller uh, tidal systems that do not need large infrastructure. Um, but the industry has also moved to looking at tidal stream um, or tidal currents which are now in the pre-commercial um, uh, technology readiness level. Wave energy converters are, I would say in TRL-6, um, this is where they have a lot of uh, pilot scales, um, prototype demonstration projects uh, happening. Uh, some of them ready to go for full scale or full array deployment. The other systems like uh, ocean thermal energy converters, uh, as you see, um, goes down the TRL level, which are in the research and development phase and needs to move up the ladder. Um, salinity gradients, uh, you know, is, is um, proven. Uh, technology is there, but um, to scale it uh, requires a, a little more uh, technology development. So moving forward, <clears throat> These different uh, marine renewable energy options um, are available um, uh, not in all countries, uh, but in most countries which are archipelagic, for sure there are some options that are possible. Um, first up would be looking at immediately um, offshore wind, right? Um, could, could be floating, could be piled, and also solar could also be floating, could also be piled. Um, this, there's a very high chance um, of feasibility up to a certain depth, of course, um, for projects that have uh, solar, marine solar, and offshore wind. Um, for those that are in the ocean renewable energy, you have marine currents and waves and thermal gradients, um, OTEC, as well as barrages, you have to pay attention to the presence of the resource and the, the technology readiness level of these um, uh, technologies. So, sorry, the slide skip there. That means that before I go into a project, I need to actually know whether that site has enough resource for me to even harness. And if there is, what kind of technology I need to 
um, apply. So if I were in the tropical region near the equator, I know that my tide height will probably be less than four meters. So in countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, the highest tidal range recorded would be in the three meter um, approximately. So uh, present technologies like barrages may not be suitable already. Uh, but there are a lot of currents um, and also some waves that could be harnessed um, uh, in certain areas uh, around, around certain countries. So salinity gradient right now, um, probably very good for energy recovery for desalination plants, but still too expensive without any co-application. That is, if you just use it for energy generation sake, the economics might not stack up. Moving forward, Orkney, uh... sorry, the Orkney Islands is uh, one example that I'd like to highlight where they have managed to tap um, more than 100% of their uh, demand by renewables. And this is a combination of what they have um, onshore, which has wind, and also offshore, um, combination of wind, combination of tides and waves. Um, and they have actually managed to spur on projects um, beyond just uh, energy and electricity for the residential, commercial, industrial use, but also um, to look at uh, other applications like electrification of vessels, hydrogen production, and, uh, and even um, battery swapping technologies, um, enabling aquaculture uh, using all these renewable energy in the cluster of islands that they have. So, this is a, a good example of what can happen um, in island uh, developing states uh, and island clusters, uh, uh, regions like um, Southeast Asia, Micronesia, Palau. So globally, we know. Globally, uh, uh, we, we have a lot of um, ocean uh, energy um, that uh, has been documented. And you know there are countries that are committed to um, developing um, uh, ocean energy projects and and in in this region at least for Southeast Asia uh, we have estimated that there could be more than a thousand sites approximately 200 megawatts each um, that can be developed and this is just an initial assessment um, uh, so that's a huge potential I would say that is yet untapped that is yet to be tapped so if we can um, figure out a way to organically and progressively develop um, the marine renewable energy uh, industry together with the applications around it, um, we probably can start harnessing these things and, and you know, maturing the supply chain as well of marine renewables. So developing countries um, have a very different approach to uh, developing technology or even developing projects because in the Western world and maybe so Europe, North America and Australia um, utilize or take advantage of their oil and gas um, expertise. This means that they tend to go uh, sort of um, large heavy machinery using maybe uh, heavy support vessels and 100,000 US dollar per day kind of deployment uh, systems. Um, so which really is hard to swallow for uh, developing countries because there might not be even a marine and offshore supply chain available um, or that if there is something uh, there, it's probably smaller. Um, so the developing countries approach has been to look at smaller systems, uh, modular systems that can be deployed uh, for islands, uh, which may not need uh, more than a megawatt or five megawatts uh, at most for developed islands. And so they need to look at smaller systems that feed into these islands. And the technology development approach has been different. So you can see uh, the difference in these two slides, the left and the right slide here. Um, but we um, can learn um, uh, a lot of things from uh, uh, how the uh, uh, non-developing countries have uh, actually looked at technology development, and the combination of that would be would be good. Um, so, for instance, um, in small, uh, low energy quote unquote low energy regions like Singapore, and this is a picture from Singapore's uh, Tanamera Ferry Terminal. Um, could we harness uh, some energy from the waves, the small waves that Singapore has? And mind you, uh, Singapore in this lower part has uh, less than 0.5 meters significant wave height, you know? So 
there exists this uh, cushion roller technology in, in platforms uh, that Singapore has in terms of their jetties that actually go up and down that guide them into the piles. So these platforms go up and down uh, with the tide and also with the movement of water. Um, as they go up and they go down, can we not harness that energy? So the technology zones um, that you can see here for wave energy range from those that are beyond one meter of significant wave height to those that are below 0.5 meter significant wave height. And you can see how um, the technology will differ uh, from one class to another just because they need to be more resilient um, when they go to energetic sites, they need to survive um, the amount of energy that's there and harness it at the same time. So whereas in low energy sites, that means you need to be re less resilient or just resilient for small amount of energy. And so what really makes sense is that the ratio of um, the cost of your technology to harness the amount of energy that's there needs to be commensurate to each other or that the levelized cost of energy makes sense, right? You spend a, a dollar, so do you get how much kilowatt hours of energy? So, um, so this is sort of the, the way that you level off um, each of the technologies that they are designed appropriately for the site and the resource that they are going to be deployed in, essentially sizing them up or developing them for a suitable uh, market. So, if, if you look at this cushion roller example, um, this uh, technology already takes advantage of uh, the floating platform that is a, being used for boarding the boat and also unloading stuff, um, uh, whether it's people or baggage and, and other things, um, it already exists. So it's built as part of the, the terminal or the jetty. The roller is there as part of the guide for the piles. So that means that uh, you don't need additional infrastructure. It's just, you need an energy conversion, energy extraction technology, which is a simple generator that you can attach to the roller to be able to harness the energy available here. And since the device is above water, maintenance issues are, are simpler uh, as compared to those that are offshore. So this is an example of what can be done with existing infrastructure, think about terminals, think about maybe floating platforms that are already out there, offshore oil rigs, um, or even, um, you know, buoys that may be there or markers. Right? Another um, demonstration project uh, we were involved in was uh, this uh, small uh, floating um, tidal uh, system, uh, which is uh, has a 50 kilowatt um, turbine uh, from shuttle, and we deployed it in Singapore. Um, and i just like to show you a video um, that highlights the thinking behind this, which uh, is pretty much, uh, I say, uh, uh, a Southeast Asian region um, type of approach um, to this technology. This project is really about appropriate technologies. Looking at Southeast Asia, where you have a lot of islands, people normally consider renewable energy with solar, wind, energy storage, diesel generation to hybridize their solutions. But rarely do you have uh, ocean renewable energy or marine renewable energy to be part of the mix. By having this project, it demonstrates the viability, feasibility of such solutions and develops a pathway for marine renewable energy to enter Southeast Asia. I think the main uh, challenge uh, for this project is uh, really the design of the platform. How to design a platform that is suitable for the deployment of this uh, turbine that uh, in bi-directional mode uh, it could still be uh, stable. The shuttle in-stream turbine is designed to be a modular system. Rather than increasing the turbine diameter, we would increase the number of turbines to be deployed. The turbine is also relatively lightweight, which makes it ideally suited for rather remote uh, communities and remote conditions such as Southeast Asia. So we can harness uh, the tides for local communities and in remote places with this simple and robust tidal energy turbine. There's clearly differences with the weather, but on the other hand, you know, the location also presents its problems because it's very sensitive and we have to be very aware of uh, other stakeholders, other people that use the same environment that we're working in. 
This project has given the enough credibility to showcase Singapore as the one of the key hubs to develop such systems that are easily deployable units to the, towards the remote coastal communities and towards the small island development states. Looking forward, we hope to see an expansion of this kind of deployment, starting off in ones and twos, then getting to tens, but perhaps getting to many hundreds or even thousands over the coming decades. There's a tremendous opportunity here in Southeast Asia for exploiting the energy that's available from the tides. Woke you up, guys. <laughs> An implementation of a high. So we the locals had that um, the tidal power uh, opportunity um, in Indonesia, and this was one very uh, unique project uh, where we were supporting an an island uh, that was powered by uh, diesel generators. Um, they were working with mangroves, um, and they had sustainable uh, mangrove uh, business um, in the in this region. Um, and they wanted to shift to renewables from their diesel uh, operations. The that uh, paved the way for the uh, deployment of one floating uh, tidal turbine system. Um, and you can see my background right now is uh, this same picture where you have a barge, which they already use, and a turbine, which uh, was um, shipped in and installed here. Uh, connected to their my island microgrid and this connection was done by them um, uh, not so uh, traditionally uh, connected through the air. this project which, uh, really uh, highlights local content here so that it's important uh, that uh, even though you have technologies coming from outside the region that you work with local uh, suppliers local um, manufacturers fabricators uh, installers um, so that they uh, uh, become part of the project and they feel that they own the project. So this is very important, especially for community-based projects. This... So uh, the, that case um, actually yielded uh, <clears throat> a reduction in the levelized cost of energy because previously with the diesel generators, they were paying almost like 50 US cents per kilowatt hour. Um, that's pretty high, you know. So uh, just because they're very remote. So if, if they started to generate electricity locally with uh, solar, a uh, combination of solar and uh, tidal energy, um, couple that with battery and you know working with their diesel as just backup, they could actually reduce by 20% um, their, their cost of electricity. So ultimately this, this project um, is shifting gear now to include um, solar on, on land and also exploring the possibility of solar offshore, meaning in the water. Okay, let's go down to some uh, geeky uh, details, uh, I would say, in terms of factors affecting uh, the levelized cost of energy. And this is one important metric that people need to understand. Um, when you talk about um, uh, marine renewables, uh, you normally ask, so how much does it cost, right? So the answer would always be, it depends. <laughs> and one of the things that uh, the cost depends is when you talk about capital expenditure, for instance, it's not just the devices, but also how you install these things. So foundations, moorings, connections, you know, everything that has to do with, with the project and preparing the site, et cetera. And then the cost of operating it. Although there is no quote unquote, uh, uh, fuel per se in terms of operating it because you harness what is available, um, the renewable energy that's available. There are other operating costs, um, maintenance and uh, um, and ma making sure that your your electrical wiring and substations are all operational, right? So the annual energy production is dependent obviously on the resource in that area and the technology that you're using in terms of its uh, capture available capturing that available available resource. So this table summarizes um, what the Ocean Energy Systems, uh, IEA, um, has gathered from those that were starting off first arrays, first projects, and then you know subsequent projects after that first project, as well as uh, 
the first commercial scale projects and what they think would be um, their cost ranges. So you have three technologies on this table, wave, um, tidal uh, in-stream, which is using tidal currents, um, and ocean thermal energy conversion. So there's a range from minimum to maximum of what the project capacity might be and the cost in terms of capex and opex. Um, so this gives you some form of levelized cost of energy as can be seen in the second array and also the first commercial project sort of numbers there. So if I were to deploy um, tidal technology and it's probably my first project and I look at a one megawatt uh, deployment, I could expect the range of my capex to be between 5 um, million uh, to uh, 14 million per megawatt right so that this is how I, this is how you read this table so and where it makes sense is obviously the, to find a sweet spot where if you have a benchmark of where your um, levelized cost of energy is or even cost of electricity using let's say your current system of diesel power if you were at uh, half or 0.5 um, US dollar per uh, kilowatt hour, right? Then you have to find a mix of a hybrid uh, set of uh, renewable energy uh, systems that you could use uh, to quote unquote displace and even replace the diesel uh, based uh, system. The key to project success, and I, I want to emphasize this bit is, um, you, you can't just build for the sake of building. You have to know that there is a need or a demand or an end use that is in existence. Um, it, it, needless to say, a good, uh, a good market um, needs to be there, um, sort of adjacent or at least accessible to a good site uh, with good resource. And when I say resource, you can't have you know good wave resource and then deploy suddenly a tidal in-stream device in it. So of course you need the appropriate technology as well. So you need to match all of these things. And these are just some of the key elements for project success. So in terms of the trajectory of technology, so this is just for wave and tidal, you notice that there is a, um, a decrease as more and more um, projects uh, and more and more uh, capacity is deployed. So, and this chart shows you, uh, you know, decreasing cost uh, in US dollar cents per kilowatt hour um, of tidal and wave um, as you move along uh, the number of deployments. Of course, these are just expected deployments. So it's important to note that there is learning as well captured in the industry. So the more that we deploy, um, the better the systems will be, the easier that you have economies of scale as well. So this leads into the, the markets and there could be early short, short term markets to um, replace remote diesel already, medium term markets that also have other applications, whether it's desalination, water pumping, right? And long-term course grid tied electricity, but these short and long-term markets can also have applications and can be enabled by, let's say, the likes of green, um, green shipping or, let's say, electrification of vessels or even the hydrogen economy. And that will be discussed, I guess, not in this webinar, but in uh, another, um, another uh, presentation. Now, ocean energy. So ocean energy has different configuration options. And I think I have the last seven minutes or so with you um, for this tail end of my presentation. But just to let you know that um, you, you have flexibility to look at whether it's near shore, jetty base, floating, underwater, semi-submerged, uh, neutrally buoyant, seabed mounted, small and big, you know. So um, it, it's flexible enough um, to have different configurations depending on the application and the site. And some deployment installation options are shown here on this slide where you have combinations of, let's say, uh, turbines plus solar, uh, floating system, um, or let's say uh, uh, smaller systems, bigger systems, um, infrastructure attached systems, etc. So in these uh, you can explore uh, even mobile ones uh, depending on your application and end use. So just so that we don't close off uh, what's possible. Um, this is a, a comparison example of uh, let's say you wanted marine floating solar, 
um, uh, vis a vis or versus maybe tidal. But actually, the answer is probably a combination. So you look at marine floating solar, you probably have for this amount of space, 140 square meters, uh, this will be uh, what's required. And you know, this, these are some technical specs and some economics around it. So you have resource 17% of the time, 20 kilowatt peak uh, for a 10 kilowatt load to be, to be um, answered uh, with energy eight hours per day. For the same demand, um, you could put tidal turbines in and if it has good resource, good currents, right? You basically half or even, you know, you just use 25% of the surface space because the flow of water, which is by the way, dense, it's 800 times more dense than, than air, right? So you have smaller machines um, in the water that harness the flow. Um, but when you combine these two, you probably end up with sort of the best uh, of both worlds where you have solar and tidal working together, right? And you may end up with a cost that is um, uh, maybe an optimal levelized cost of energy. So the power of hybrids is something which is being explored um, globally as well. And for countries like the Philippines, there would be sites that could have hybrids of tidal currents and, and wave, for instance, you know. Um, so just to take note, I guess this video uh, shows you one technology, uh, which I will talk through a little bit of, uh, I would say a collaboration of uh, uh, European design thinking as well as uh, developing countries Southeast Asian design thinking. So they started off with um, neutrally buoyant submerged um, uh, turbines, but now their, their latest design are floating systems that have turbines that go in and out of the water so that it's easy for maintenance and the tow out does not require huge vessels but rather uh, just needs uh, your traditional tugs which could be an order of magnitude cheaper. So these floating systems can be built um, in very simple shipyards or harbor um, fabricators, right? And, and things are, are uh, you, you can easily maintain it, you can easily access it. And this shows you how uh, tidal current um, machines uh, work, you know, with uh, uh, the reverse in the flow, uh, which exists in tidal locations, you know, so you expect uh, tides to go in from one side and then also reverses um, in, during certain timings. So this uses the same turbines that we've deployed uh, both in Indonesia and Singapore, which are modular, so they're smaller, therefore, you know, it's easy for them to uh, easy to train up uh, local folks as well. And from this uh, uh, four turbine uh, system, they've now scaled up to looking at a six um, turbine system, which is uh, with a higher capacity, I think 420 kilowatts now. Um, and we think that uh, these types of uh, uh, technologies, which are you know mainly uh, the design process is thinking about how locals can start building these systems, um, importing maybe specialized components, but assembling, building, if they have local capability for shipbuilding, that they can build it locally, really adds value to how um, uh, technologies can be developed. Yeah. So this is currently uh, being deployed in, uh, in Canada, but uh, you know, we can look at uh, these types of systems to be deployed as well in other regions. Um, so I just wanted to flash a slide here. That if we try and go larger scale, bigger scale, you know, let's say 100 megawatt, 200 megawatt systems, what would be the feed-in tariff or the levelized cost of energy um, that we look at, right? Um, where we can make sense of a project. So this uh, has three different sensitivities um, in terms of uh, uh, costs, right? If uh, it was a very expensive, let's say $8 million per megawatt kind of uh, thing, which was what was the cost uh, of uh, tidal energy, tidal in-stream energy, uh, maybe five years ago or so, but now it's going lower. Um, maybe we expect it to be uh, closer to $4 million per megawatt. So, and that means it already makes sense um, to look at, um, sorry, this is in pesos per kilowatt hour. Um, 10 pesos is approximately uh, 20 US cents per kilowatt hour. So um, you could already make sense of uh, projects um, if 
uh, there is some reduction um, in costs at the moment. And we expect this to even lower by 30% if you had uh, local uh, fabrication uh, capability. So a lot of the hybrids um, that are being explored right now have to do with maybe combining solar with, let's say, something that is uh, ocean renewable. So it's not unusual to find combination already of solar and, and wind, for instance, right? Now people are talking about com combining wind and wave or uh, solar plus tidal plus wave. So depending on where you are, you can always explore options. Uh, to harness the most of the resources around you and make that work for you in terms of applications that you need, whether it's offshore or on the island. So this is an example of just one techno-economic model where we find that if we uh, look at just solar versus just tidal and a combination, again, this is in the Philippines, uh, you can actually end up um, optimizing, right? And this shows you, you know, three graphs here. The top one is just solar output um, throughout the 365 days year, the x-axis and the y-axis is sort of the, um, the, uh, uh, the 24 hours per day. So, and the colors give you sort of the kind of output you have. Um, so solar obviously um, is only present during the day, not during the night. And then tidal is present, um, it could be present. Um, uh, day or night, um, but you can see the kind of patterns that, that it produces, right? So um, then diesel consumption peaks sort of in the evening. So if you combine these um, different um, power outputs, depending on the energy demand, obviously you end up with a, an optimal mix and the blended rate could be cheaper than just the diesel rate, which most of these islands have. As a reference, uh, some of the projects um, that are out there uh, already with some either commercial feed-in tariff or power purchase agreement, right? Or a benchmark levelized cost of energy are shown in this table. Uh, I wanted to highlight that, you know, um, most of the energy projects related to uh, re offshore renewables, marine renewables, uh, looking at um, some form of electricity provision primarily to, um, consume either to the grid or, or some uh, private industry. Um, we, we should probably shift that way of thinking to, towards a bit more holistic thinking into the, what ecosystem services can be. So um, beyond just thinking about electricity production um, and electricity use just for you know, uh, residential or powering up of the grid, um, there could be other applications that we need to pay attention to. And this is where Maris, I think, um, contributes heavily and plays a lot uh, of, of benefit uh, when we look at this hybridized marine renewable energy pathway. So for the sector to grow and for more installations to happen, there needs to be applications that, that um, require such, app, such uh, technologies. So off-grid and co-application markets will be low-hanging fruit, a uh, low-hanging low yeah, fruit that people can go for. And you can have Maris applications at various scales. So towards maybe even cluster of islands, microgrids, uh, and you can have also large scale uh, commercial projects could be grid tied as well. And we see this as a progressive development of uh, how, how projects um, can become. And ultimately, um, uh, Maris contributes uh, to uh, the sustainable blue economy. Um, you know, when I, when I see Maris, uh, marine aquaculture, reuse, renewable energy, and ecotourism, I always think of this picture, <laughs> which showcases, you know, marine renewable energy, showcases, um, you know, um, vessels, electric boats, uh, ports, and leisure, uh, social, uh, fishing, underwater, diving. So this is sort of the picture that I, I have in my mind. Electrification is more than just electricity supply. Actually, you talk about um, transport sector, aquaculture, food security. So the water, energy, food uh, nexus is enabled. Digitalization um, is enabled, right? And, and with that, um, you end up with having a more sustainable integrated development for islands and coasts that look at um, impactful applications of renewable, of marine renewable energy. So it's a, it's a spectrum, right? And uh, I dare say that this is non-exhaustive, whatever is on this slide. Yeah, but uh, in countries uh, like uh, those in Southeast Asia, well, combining renewable energy with applications like green transport, aquaculture, water production, freezing, cooling, right? And other um, local content um, um, 
is it's just uh, not just a combination of technologies, but also of the ecosystems around it. And, and this is particularly important to understand that all these various efforts um, that may be happening or that we can think about needs to be orchestrated and coordinated properly. Uh, otherwise, um, it, it will probably just end up as one-off projects, these various efforts. So consolidating them um, actually strengthens the synergy uh, amongst the use of the technologies towards long-term sustainability and spurring off maybe new products and services because of it. Um, and I know Steve has always mentioned this and other colleagues at the uh, Asian Development Bank, um, regener regenerative marine industries. And, and I, for one, think that it is possible to look at um, uh, having that um, incorporated in the way that we plan um, the use of, of energy towards certain applications um, that also help the environment uh, directly. So some potential pilot projects, I would say, would uh, range from you know having marine renewable energy um, um, sort of linked up with systems and ecosystems, um, some innovations around business models, um, and then some of the sectors or applications which are highlighted here, um, including reef restoration and marine protected area monitoring, for instance, right? And so. Uh, if we were to move marine renewable energy from just, oh, I want energy connected to the grid to something else, which probably is more impactful, especially for countries that are uh, that have islands and coasts um, and where where the, the where blue resources and, and the marine ecosystems are, are important and 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 valuable um, to to that particular nation, then we have to think of a combination uh, of approaches. So with that, I summarize and conclude that marine renewable energy options do exist, right? And we do have low hanging fruits starting from the greening of marine and maritime ecosystems, uh, looking at a suite of applications and that we need a progressive development approach uh, towards the blue economy where we leverage maybe the existing ecosystems of uh, countries and regions, developing capability, having maybe stepping stones of uh, development projects, pilot projects, and you know, hybridizing um, the systems and having co-applications will be key to success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mike, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I just want to congratulate you. You've got a great turnout as well, and you've got a bumper crop of questions. Oh. So. Uh, because we've got a little bit le less time, I'm going to kick straight into the questions. Yeah. Um, so, Ronaldo Santiago asks, does the Philippines have a framework to adopt this hybrid solution to isolated areas? So, I, I will answer that with uh, both a yes and a no. <laughs> so, I would say that, uh, I mean, the off-grid areas uh, already have some mechanism to adopt renewable energy. And I know the ADB is heavily, hev heavily um uh, helping on, on how that can be moved along uh, even more. Um, but also there are revenue models uh, beyond just the traditional framework of doing it, but leasing, for instance, looking at the um, uh, National Power Corporation's uh, small power utilities group, um, you could plug into them, have a lease agreement with them, or maybe embedded generation with the electric cooperatives is possible as well. Um, and you know, we've spoken to a number of folks, and I know that the EU is also keen to have this nationally appropriated mitigation action um, facility, BTAP, for off-grid areas. So we can have a bit more chat about that, Rinaldo, I think. Uh, not enough time for now, but the answer is yes uh, and, and no, because it's sort of uh, tough to navigate it, right? But if you know how to, you can. Right. Juan Paulo Jose has uh, another question. So may I ask, the, there, are there, if there are MRE projects in the Philippines that will push through, i.e. lily pad? Um, there are uh, not actual deployments, uh, I would say, that are substantial enough. Um, I'm not sure. I've, I've not, not actually heard that the lily pad uh, was, was deployed. Um, so there's a lot of... Um, uh, ocean energy service contracts uh, that are moving forward, uh, let's say likes of Sabella and HNWB, Ocean Terra, Sustainable Marine Energy. Um, there's a project funded by the Department of Science and Technology um, for uh, 
somewhere in Davao uh, to look at a floating uh, tidal turbine system. You know, so there are a few of these activities uh, here and there, but uh, I think uh, we probably need to deploy something. I, I know there's sort of a a wave power or wave energy harvesting uh, vessel. And I know that there is already a, a solar powered boat, which uh, Scott spoke about probably last week. So um, we need to be able to go beyond um, just these small um, uh, demonstrations um, and actually deploy something in the water. I think marine floating solar might be the easiest because you take floors, solar system, solar uh, PV and, and put it on barges and, and just deploy it and you can have a pilot project immediately, right? But so you're talking about tidal and wave. Um, uh, it's in the pipeline, um, but uh, probably expect something the next two, three years. Next question from Rear Admiral Nick Lambert. Do you see a growth in the offshore support vessel sector to enable MRE, ORE? Uh, yes, uh, I would say, actually, I uh, think I just spoke to um, someone in Singapore that's doing a hybrid electric offshore support vessel um, for Taiwan's uh, offshore wind. So um, offshore support vessels probably would be good to have um, as a, you know, having offshore charging stations could be one application um, where you have hybrid electric vessels. And even for aquaculture, going offshore aquaculture, they don't need to bring in a lot of fuel or diesel anymore. So um, I would I would say that there is, uh, uh, there is enough to enable uh, MRE and ORE, um, just looking at this traditional applications. Um, and, you know, I think it goes the other way as well. The growth in MRE or the maturity of MRE can also um, influence the technology shift in uh, the offshore uh, industry. Okay. Next question from Ronaldo Santiago again. Do we have a technology acquisition and utilization model for hybrid energy resources? <laughs> wow, uh, that seems very specific. Technology acquisition and utilization model for hybrid energy resources. So there's definitely a framework for having technology um, uh, either developed or imported and utilized in country. I assume you're talking about the Philippines. Um, in terms of hybrids, uh, this sort of backing, um, I know Senator Gatchalian spoke about, um, you know, microgrids a lot. And, and now uh, there's talk on, um, uh, renewable portfolio standards for off-grid areas. So that's good. But ultimately, it, it boils down to whether the, sorry to say this, the, the people have the balls <laughs> to, to <laughs> sorry about that, Steve. Yeah, but the, the people have um, uh, the courage to actually adopt uh, solutions, even if um, they're not so traditional in the way that they structure things. So uh, I, I, it's possible and we can navigate it. Um, legally navigate it uh, with the help of uh, very good uh, lawyers and very good uh, 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 structuring corporate corporate partners, I suppose. Yeah, but uh, there is a pathway towards that. Yeah. Severia Navarro, uh, what does it take to make ocean renewable energy to be granted a, with a fit under the Philippine RA law? Okay, it's good. Um, so there's a process, obviously, to go through the National Renewable Energy Board to talk about feed-in tariff. But um, so for project developers to put that forward, um, I think um, it's, it's just a matter of time before they submit something to the Energy Regulatory Commission. But um, there needs to be some form of reference project. And the reference project uh, out of, outside the country may not be as strong as a reference project within the country. So the first mover needs to be there. And uh, this is where, you know, grants or technical assistance can help support um, the case of having uh, a system in the water um, that's generating power and there is an off taker and you get all the techno-economic data that you can as a reference project. And I think within the Philippine RE law, um, you know, um, there's, uh, we almost had one, um, it was uh, deferred, but then it was, uh, not approved. So that means we reach the stage of actually having the feed-in tariff ref rate um, into the Energy Regulatory Commission. So um, with a pilot project that is in there, maybe a small scale one, uh, we hope that we can um, get the regulatory approval uh, uh, with the appropriate um, 
let's say, level of feed-in tariff um, based on the actual in-country reference. We have another question, but it's from anonymous attendee, and I have a policy of not asking. If someone wants to ask a question, they have to identify themselves. So I'll go to the questions in the chat. With respect to the uh, Singapore tidal turbine engine, what was the cost of such system, platform turbine system, transfer system of energy generated? Is there still is it still deployed and generating energy output? How much power generation for that wow. system per hour? Is yeah. the system generating sustained all the time, or is it dependent on tidal current movement? It's, yeah. A lot of questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so that Singapore demonstration platform uh, is no longer in in Sentosa, so you can't see it anymore. Um, and uh, well, the cost roughly just the floating platform was a hundred thousand Sing dollars. Um, the turbine itself was approximately hundred thousand US dollars. Um, the so the overall project was around five hundred thousand uh, Sing dollars. So deployed, right? And the output of which uh, was um, dependent ultimately dependent on when the, the currents are in and out right and because that location uh, was chosen to be sort of the highlight location the currents were strong but not strong enough for a sustained output obviously yeah i don't remember the kilowatt hours per se now so off the top of my head but it is when the ties come in that's when you have power no energy storage so but you don't need to be sort of base load 24 7 right so for certain applications you probably just want to generate whenever there's tide, and that's okay. Okay, so Dan Millison's asked a question about modifying all the ships with tidal stream generators and mounting solar and maybe vertical axis wind turbines on top. Um, so basically the Second World War uh, conversion to carrier fleet type model, um, ships to support agriculture. Egypt. What do you think of that, Mike? You think it's a bridge too far, or it'll have a whole bunch of marine uh, naval issues and naval architecture issues? Um, so, technically speaking, you can design such a ship or, or platform, right? What would be nice is actually to um, have them deploy systems uh, only when they're needed. So, for instance, you could have um, uh, systems that actually uh, uh, keep themselves, right? So, the turbines may not be. Um, out, up, and erected uh, when they're traveling, you know. So, but when they reach site, and this is how mobile platforms will probably be utilized, and they anchor on a site where there's good current, tidal current resource, or there's good wind resource, then they deploy the appropriate technology. I mean, coming out of the system using arms, etc., right? And and that's sort of how floating platforms for tidal streams right now have been uh, have been developed. They're floating platforms with turbines, sort of secured and then when they reach a site they're deployed and they get raised up out of the water when it's time to maintain them so i don't see that as impossible really and it's been done already right for wind turbines to come out of uh, uh, floating systems whether it's ships or floating platforms you you do need to pay attention to um, the naval architecture and the engineering design of things but it's not impossible for sure solar easy right that's the easiest probably because ships already exist with solar right so it's not impossible. Uh, again, it, it's the end use of it. So you can have fleets, obviously, with this. And I don't think uh, people from the Navy have already approached us um, from various countries to look at you know, um, having these in, th in their systems, primarily because they need um, resilience and endurance um, to stay in a site and not go back to the mainland every time they need fuel or not send out you know fueling uh, expeditions out to them so they need this to keep consistent in terms of their borders so i dare say that um, soon <laughs> uh, it's probably an adoption that will happen necessarily okay uh, another question from alfred kenneth uh do you mike what's the proposal for consolidation of these technologies for sustainment i think you mean sustainability it may be difficult to, or, or to actually sustain them it may be difficult to place such consolidation in the hands of government with the rotate, rotation and term and tenure, um, which I think goes to the issue of how do you make sure people running the system? Uh, do you need to do PPPs? Do you need to look at uh, leasing areas? What's your proposal on that? Because obviously that is a challenge in the Philippines when you have changes in administration. It's a challenge in a number of countries, actually. Yeah. So... Um... <clears throat> I mean, PPA is a traditional model, right? So um, if you can't go there, you need to think of ways, um, let's say a private lease. Um, if you had real estate developers come in and develop, let's say infrastructure, um, one project we have um, that's being uh, 
sort of studied at the moment is uh, a large scale development on an island for potentially um, uh, ecotourism plus, you know, um, a port, an airport, and then uh, some commercial infrastructure, uh, some uh, residential and industrial complexes. Economic zones are, for, are, are very good, for instance, right? So if there are private uh, sort of lease agreements or private power purchase agreements, quote unquote, um, then you can have uh, an initial bit which leads uh, the investors of uh, or project developers to make the project um, uh, attractive, attractive because uh, the moment that you have a willing payer and willing to sign off on a 15, 20 year <laughs> agreement, um, you know, it more or less gives some security that um, the upfront investment can be recovered. And there are uh, investors out there willing to front up this type of, uh, of, of projects. Um, they just need to make sure that, you know, whoever the end user is, whether it's an aquaculture company or a conglomerate that's utilizing island space or offshore stuff uh, for their own uh, business, um, actually uh, can sign off on, let's say, uh, an L uh, almost like a an electricity payment, right, um, for them. So, and that... Uh, that model um, is being utilized for the uptake of these smaller projects as well. Yeah. Sorry, Steve, you're on mute. My apologies, Mike. I think we're gonna go over in the questions. So let's just keep going. We'll keep recording because there's some very good questions being asked. Um, Scott Countryman asks, are gravity batteries being used in ocean energy systems for energy story, I, storage, i.e. Ocean water pumped up to large reservoirs on top of islands and released as needed to generate hydropower. Yeah, so uh, we've taken a look at that. Um, yeah, in, in some areas, some locations that might be okay. Um, so you might not even need a vessel that is sort of um, on the water, right? You can have it sort of onshore as well, you know, pump, pump hydro storage effectively pumping it from the sea <laughs> this time. So, so it's possible. Um, there's nothing to stop you from doing um, gravity-based storage system. Um, it's whether or not there is a case uh, for sort of economics, but definitely that is an energy storage system that should be looked at uh, when it comes to marine and offshore. Um, but I think with the accelerated decline of the cost of uh, storage um, for you know typical um, electrochemical storage and even hydrogen energy storage um, you may want to rethink as to where that could play a part or is it in the small scale large scale or is it because you're already doing something with the water something else with the water maybe like uh, if you're in aquaculture and offshore aquaculture maybe maybe you already have a tank that needs sort of this seawater and maybe the energy recovery from the release of that water into the fish um, or whether it's fresh water or some other um, not so dirty water, then maybe the energy recovery is what you can think of in terms of uh, energy production back to your, to your application. But technically yeah. speaking, it's not impossible. Yeah. yeah, okay. And I'll add some more to that later on because there's a couple of questions about environmental impacts, which I think will weld it together. Um, okay, so Dan's got a um, question and he's uh, talking about EcoArc from Mr. Leo in Singapore, which we'll talk about. I'm actually going to ask Mr. Leo to come and present at some stage. We'll go back to the questions. Um, uh, and as I said, if you want to ask a question, you've got to identify yourself. So Richard Edwards, thank you very much for identifying yourself. And this goes to the questions of environmental impacts. Um, how does Maris address environmental impacts from ocean uh, energy deployment? And I'll, I'll let me answer that question from a point of view of the Mares TA. The Mares TA, one of our team managers, Frances, Francesco Ricciardi, who I think is on the call, he is a uh, environmental specialist in our uh, safeguards division. And uh, yes, we will have to assess whether, you know, these turbines are a threat to marine life. Are they in sensitive areas where perhaps they could impact breeding areas and stuff like that. And that is another reason why you have to look at uh, the environmental impacts and the ecological the impact on the ecosystem services. You don't want to site these, uh, you don't want to site these plants in areas where they could have a, a negative environmental impact and they want to put them in plant places where you have the lowest possible impact. Um, the environment group has recently been doing some work on uh, offshore wind and wind allocations. And one of course, the great impacts of wind is it's its impact on bird life. 
And uh, what's interesting is a great deal of information is known about migratory paths and the impact on birds. And with a bit of common sense, the uh, impact on birds can be grossly reduced simply by looking at the siting of wind resources and looking at where you put these facilities. That's another thing that we have to look at because the last thing we want to do is to tell governments that they should do all of this along their coastline and then we've created another problem. So Mike, could you just give a quick talk about um, the impact of some of these technologies, which sure. are benign and which probably need a bit more work? Yeah, sure. So for ocean energy technologies, um, I mentioned earlier that um, uh, probably tidal barrages are uh, the, mo the highest in terms of environmental impact. So people are moving away from the traditional tidal barrage, trapping water in the Bay areas because that messes up with all the, the nutrient fluxes and the movements of water in and out, et cetera. So that one people are, are trying to move away. So in terms of the other um, marine renewable energy, offshore wind um, that has been studied and you know, um, as, as long as you uh, um, uh, have enough environmental examination on offshore wind as to not be in the migration routes, et cetera. Um, you can, you, you don't expect uh, a lot of environmental impact on these uh, things. Um, so what I would say is that um, for tidal, um, people always ask, won't fish uh, get chopped because of the turbine blades that are spinning underwater? Well, first of all, I think, um, uh, fish are not that stupid <laughs> to go into blades. Uh, they don't do that also with, with boats, you know, and the rotors are spinning actually very slowly. Uh, they're also passive. Um, so, um, and even if they do bump these things, um, it's been studied um, by the OES folks that uh, it would be similar to the impact of you get, getting hit by a ping pong ball on your head. So it's not, not too much. Um, that being said, uh, this floating systems or infrastructure at sea, um, uh, actually act as, as aggregators. Um, they act as aggregators for uh, organisms. And the moment that they do that, you know, you can expect some life around them, which is sometimes going to be a problem for the device if there isn't any maintenance on them because uh, it messes up with the hydrodynamics of the blades or, or things like that. But so it actually acts as aggregators. Um, and maybe even as potential artificial reefs in terms of maybe the gravity-based foundations and systems, especially for highly um, biodiverse sites. And because you're not deploying them um, in very dense manners um, in terms of a race, there's enough space for you and enough wiggle room around it. Um, it probably just compares to a fleet of vessels. And in Singapore, we have a fleet of vessels just in the south of Singapore that are quote unquote just um, birth or part um, with certain distance from each other. So that's already being done with, with, with vessels and in fleets. And you know, people don't question that. Um, they're probably even dirtier because they have uh, fossil fuel based systems that go into the sea. Whereas you have renewable energy systems that are passive and harness renewable energy and don't use these types. Oil leaks, for instance, would not be an issue that you have for renewable energy systems. So, if there is an environmental impact, probably it's a positive one. Well, that's something I think we need to study, but certainly the link between fish and ping pong balls was not something that I was aware of. <laughs> um, um, and look, I just wanted to thank everyone for their questions. And can we finish with the last question from Michael Rizare, which is about the Singapore installation based on your observation, what do you think the ROI on that project would be? Okay, so um, if you're talking about the demonstration project, the ROI is probably going to be very long for that particular installation. But if you put it in a more appropriate site, somewhere like in the south of St. John's, where you have stronger currents, right? That's an island off the south of Singapore, for those yeah. that don't know. Uh, um, you probably expect it to be in the, you know, your your traditional sort of uh, seven to 12 years kind of range. Yeah, But uh, if you hybridize that, um, you probably will be closer to the seven, eight years um, kind of range. So uh deploy tile systems with with solar on top of them um probably makes better sense right? you're already there you already have a floating platform so why not why not hybridize it mike that is a great answer to finish on because i think that's the essence of what we were talking about with integrating all of these approaches from mares which is how do we turn uh, particular activities which on their own don't look particularly good into activities that at a local scale can give a 
15 to 18% return on investment so that um, retail and local investors and local people can get involved in it and that large scale investments can make commercial returns, but the local investments are enough to create jobs and also um, to make, uh, make a return so people can make a living. So on that note, I thank you very much for a great presentation, mate. Um, and uh, we look forward to having Dan Millison next week talking about, uh, talking about uh, the oceans. And if you see in the chat, I've left a link to the data room on the Myris TA, which is at events.development.asia. Uh, and uh, please, this, rev res this webinar will be loaded up sometime in the next uh, sort of day or so. Uh, but you'll also see the previous presentations made by Rear Admiral McLambert, uh, by Scott Countryman and by Tom Bowling. Uh, we have two more presentations to go and then we will be doing a session at the Asian Clean Energy Forum as well. So thank you very much for your interest and Mike, thank you again. You're welcome, yeah. Thank you all. Thank you.